Thanks, Anna. Uh, well, fantastic to see so many people have joined so far. I think we're up to about 160. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide, Anna, but just to introduce myself, my name's Clive Thomas. Um, I'm speaking to you first because I'm the project manager for the Agroforestry Carbon Code, um, but I do that as part of my work for the Soil Association, uh, where I'm a advisor leading on regenerative forestry, including trees and woodlands in the farm landscape. So my job today is to help coordinate the webinar and pass on some basic information about the project that we're going to be talking to you about in the first hour. Um, and just to introduce some of my colleagues, but also the kind of wider partnership. So you'll also be hearing from Will Simonson uh, from the Organic Research Centre. You'll be hearing from Alona Coulson Ashworth from the Woodland Trust uh, and Sarah Dara from Finance Earth. So those uh, so Woodland Trust, Organic Research Centre and Finance Earth are core partners within this overall project. Um, We've also got Ben with us on the call today, Ben Raskin, who's going to be helping to facilitate the Mentimeter questions. Uh, but just to mention two other partners um, who we're working with as part of this project, Scottish Forestry, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, manage the Woodland Carbon Code on behalf of the wider UK partnership. Uh, and we also have some input from Mark Reed from the Scottish Rural College. So that's the overall partnership. Um, now I'm going to say a bit more about the second half of the webinar, the second hour uh, on the next slide, uh, but just to give you a quick overview um, of what we're going to be doing in the first hour. So just to introduce that this project is one of the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund projects. Uh, we're a phase, what's known as a phase two project uh, and NERF, which is the acronym, is, is DEFRA funding and administered by the Environment Agency. Now we've only been going for about two to three months on this project, um, but we wanted to hold this webinar quite early on uh, during the project, just to be very transparent about what's going on, um, to let you know who's involved and to give you some uh, information about how we're organising ourselves and how we're taking the work forward. Uh, but I'm sure you can appreciate we're only a few months in um, and we've probably got as many questions as you all have. Um, so for the first hour, we've not just we've decided not to host a specific Q&A. As Anna's already said, please put your questions in the chat. They will be very helpful for us in terms of the project. Um, instead, what we're going to do as part of this hour is ask you a few questions via Menti, Mentimeter. Um, I think the risk of us hosting a Q&A so early on in the project is that, uh, as I say, we're still asking a lot of questions ourselves uh, and there'll be a lot of responses along the lines of it depends if or, or we don't know yet. Um, so we're committed to continuing to provide information throughout the project um, and no doubt we'll be hosting other events uh, as we as we get further forward. OK, um, so that's the first half. Sorry, Anna, could you go back a slide? Um, yeah, so just to let you know what we'll be doing in the second half of, of the webinar, we felt like we couldn't um, bring such a big group of you together. I think there's um, nearly 200 of you now uh, and not try and add a bit more value um, to this topic of agroforestry by um, having a few short presentations that are relevant, I think, to this kind of wider topic. So in the second half, we're going to hear from uh, George Channerin from Cumulus Consultants, who worked with ourselves, the Soil Association, on our recent report, Woodland and Trees in the Farm Landscape. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Andrew Allen from the Woodland Trust uh, about also their recent report, Farming for the Future, how agroforestry can deliver for nature and climate. Uh, and finally, we'll be hearing from Colin Tosh from the Organic Research Centre uh, about some developments around landscape carbon quantification. Um, and as I say, that's really to try and add value to the fact that we've um, hosting this webinar to, to give you some awareness and some uh, some information about those reports or that, that ongoing research. Uh, we will be hearing for about 15 minutes from each of those speakers uh, and then we will be having a short Q&A 
at the end of that second hour uh, and Anna will introduce how to ask a question through the Mentimeter. Uh, and the benefit of doing it through Mentimeter is that um, you'll be able to upvote questions so that uh, we can hear or we can take the questions that are of most interest to people. Next, please, Anna. OK, as I've said, we're going to be using Mentimeter um, and the way this works best is if you have uh, a separate window open um, with that website and if you enter that voting code when we get to the questions or when we get to the Q&A in the second hour, uh, you'll be able to um, participate using using that tool. OK, next please, Anna. OK, so this is uh, a quote from our funding application to, to DEFRA for the Agroforestry Carbon Co project. Um, so I think this introduces hopefully quite well what we're trying to do. So the project is investigating the carbon sequestered by infield agroforestry systems and the feasibility and opportunity to generate robust carbon credits. Now credits might be used for either insetting as a contribution to landowner supply chain net zero strategies or potentially for sale to third parties as credits for offsetting of unavoidable emissions within a robust emissions reduction strategy. So as I say, this is a, a NERF funded project. We only have a 12 month timeline um, and by the end of that 12 months, so the end of next June, um, it's highly unlikely that there will be a code that is launched and ready to go. As it says on that slide, uh, instead we're aiming to investigate the feasibility uh, for there to be and for there to be a clear route ahead. Uh, and conceivably there's a whole range of spectrum of op outcomes uh, from this project or certainly this first 12 months of this project. Uh, potentially ranging from no go, i.e. we've investigated the feasibility uh, and there isn't an opportunity. Uh, all the way through to potentially a standalone code like some of the other carbon codes uh, and every shade of hybrid in between. That really making that judgment and outlining the next steps, that really is the essence of the key outcome from this project. Now, as I say, uh, as I said, NERF funding is from DEFRA, um, but the per for the purposes of this feasibility project, we're investigating the feasibility for the UK. So if there is an outcome, a positive outcome from this project in terms of some sort of code uh, or some sort of methodology, uh, our idea is that that will have a UK application. Uh, and to that, for, to that intent, uh, we have some additional funding already confirmed from the Scottish Government uh, for some pilots in Scotland. Uh, and we also have a call out to the Welsh Government for potentially some pilots in Wales, not yet confirmed. Um, but that would certainly help, I think, with a sort of wider stakeholder engagement. Next slide, please, Anna. OK, so I'm going to give you um, some information about um, the, the first of these work streams on this slide, so the code development. Um, but just so you're aware, we're organising ourselves around these three main work streams um, and I'll be followed by Will, who will talk to you about the carbon measurement work stream, and then by Alona and Sarah, who will talk to you about the, the pilots that we intend running. Next, please. Next, please. So code development, why and what? OK, so to answer the question of why why bother to investigate the feasibility for an agroforestry carbon code? We just need to remind ourselves, I think, of all the benefits and opportunities to support farm level objectives, but also public policy that agroforestry potentially delivers. So whether that's the climate mitigation objectives of the Climate Change Committee in their report on net zero, or the policy and practitioner benefits set out in Soil Association and Woodland Trust reports that you'll be hearing about in the second hour, uh, or whether it's the practitioner case made in the agroforestry handbook. Uh, I think we're all most of most of the people probably on this webinar are aware that there's been a lot of advocacy around agroforestry in recent years. Uh, and 
to a great extent, I think both the sort of policy, the policy case is increasingly accepted, I think, in terms of the public benefits from agroforestry. Uh, I think there's still a long way to go in terms of raising awareness um, with the main, a mainstream farming audience about the potential benefits at a farm level. Um, but there's an awful lot of momentum around agroforestry. Um, but we're also aware that as it stands at the moment, there isn't a huge amount of public sector support or public funding support for agroforestry. Again, that's a very active area of advo advocacy uh, and development. Um, and certainly the organisations that are involved in this partnership uh, are doing that as part of our wider work. Um, but really, the, re the reason for investigating the agroforestry carbon code idea is whether or not there's additional potential private finance uh, that might help to upscale implementation. And you'll be hearing a bit more about that from Sarah uh, later on in the pilots, but that um, does take us to um, the first question that we want to pose to you via Menti. So uh, this is a summary of the. Could you just go back a slide? Yeah. So the way to think about this question before we ask you to respond on the Menti is uh, there's significant upfront capital costs uh, involved in implementing agroforestry systems before some of those farm level benefits to soil health, livestock, crops or farm environmental management can be delivered or for the wider public benefits um, to be delivered through biodiversity, climate and water. So if you can now go to the Menti question, Anna. Oh, people have already oh, started yeah, yeah. to answer it. I'll let you take over, Ben. That's fine. Yeah. So yeah, people are getting stuck in already. Great. Um, so yeah, is the potential use of carbon finance to support the investment in agroforestry systems worth exploring? So quite a general one just to get you get you thinking. Uh, have you um yeah you've posted the menti thing haven't you anna there we go in the chat so if you if you haven't seen the link in the chat then do we got 66 people responded already a couple of skeptics quite a few don't knows or depends nobody thinking it's totally worthless idea so that's reassuring at least uh, we've got 94 people responded. Any others? Wait a little bit more because we've got, I think we've got nearly 200 people on it. Oh, there we go. There's a jump. Let's see if we can hit 140 respondents, Clive, shall we? Yeah, I think so. People can carry on answering uh, exactly. as we carry on. So, but yeah, I mean, I would say overwhelmingly, people think it's worth exploring. Um, although, not surprisingly, there are some depends on that as well. Well, I guess that was the starting point, Ben, for why we put in the funding because uh, we thought it was worth at least exploring. Um, so, that's comforting to to read that bar chart. I think. Yeah, so I think we'll probably hand back to you, Clive. I think we're up to three, 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 three or something. So, thank you. Okay, so final couple of slides from me, just to, as I say, sort of introduce the the overall project, um, and just to use this slide here um, to talk you through. I guess some of the key things that we'll be focusing on uh, as we progress over the next few months. Uh, so we've got them in five different categories here. So first of all, the science, um, the science around how do we measure carbon in infield trees and soil, uh, but also questions about um, emissions that might be relevant to the implementation of agroforestry. So some of the things that would need to be taken into account. Now you'll be hearing about uh, that. That's the work stream where we have made most progress and you'll be hearing from Will in a moment on that one. Uh, the second category is what you might call the sort of key requirements. So those of you that are familiar with codes or standards, you know, what are the basic rules that would have to be complied with? So some of the big questions 
that we'll be needing to answer uh, as we develop a response to that are things like additionality. So the idea of um, does the carbon finance actually make a difference to implementation or would it have happened anyway? How do we deal with issues of permanence? Um, there's obviously some specific aspects in the Woodland Carbon Code that are helpful around legislation. They're not necessarily the same for agroforestry, so we'll be having to answer that. Uh, we'll also be having to take a view on what carbon exactly can be counted, counted uh, and also things like buffers. Do we need to have some sort of risk management strategy uh, in any code? So that's the second category. Third one is around governance. Um, so it might be governance around the, the credits themselves, what type of credits can be issued and, and how are they registered and tracked? How do we make sure that there's things like double counting doesn't happen uh, and that there's a clear transparency uh, over credits? They're only they're only worthwhile if they're, 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 they're issued once and used once from a climate perspective. Uh, and then also a bigger question about how does this operate in the longer run? You seem to have lost the slide, Anna. Uh, I think there was a challenge with it being full screen, so I suspect she's just trying to um, reshare. OK. Um, I think I can remember that. So the um, the question of governance about uh, any code into the future, if there is a code uh, developed or if it's part of a wider code, how does that get managed? Which organisations are going to sort of step forward and uh, and manage it in the longer run, like Scottish Forestry manages the Woodland Carbon Code on behalf of a wider UK partnership. So those sorts of questions. Um, the fourth category is around verification. So if this is to be about sales of uh, credits to third parties or even um, robustness around the idea of insetting and, and confirmation um, that these credits have been generated, uh, they'll need we'll need to think about that verification step. So what are the verification rules uh, and will any verification bodies be interested in um, pursuing this opportunity? So another another big category for us to think about there. Uh, and finally, the overall sort of investment case. And again, as I say, you'll be hearing a bit more about this from from Sarah from Finance Earth shortly. Um, but what is the revenue potential for for this? Um, and and you know, will will anybody actually be interested in investing um, from a third party perspective? So that's a very quick sort of synopsis of all the things that we're going to be considering in the project. Um, and as I said at the start, we very much hope to come back to you um, as we develop responses to those questions uh, to get some sort of further feedback um, about more detailed propositions. Next slide, please. OK, the final slide for me, um, just to kind of introduce the stages, I guess, that we're we're developing here. So um, first of all, we're kind of developing um, a response to some of these things. So, you know, what are those basic rules? How are we going to measure the carbon? What's the overall sort of investment case? What's the sort of verification model? Uh, and then we're going to be um, piloting and testing those. So as I say, you'll hear a bit more about that from Alona and Sarah, um, how we're going to go about that. Uh, we'll be testing it with farmers, but also with the, the sort of wider financial case. Um, and I think where we'll get to at the end of this 12 month NERF funded project is, is a sort of moment in the middle there between pilot and test and possible revision um, of, of, of a sort of further refinement of the code if there is to be a code uh, and a potential launch at some point in the future. So really, we're going to be using that development and that pilot and test first two stages to test that feasibility and that opportunity uh, and then form this judgment as to whether or not there is a strong case here, uh, which will then lead us to to revise and finalise hopefully a code uh, or a methodology or some way of this being handled into the future. OK, I think we've got another question for you um, that's kind of linked to some of the things I've just talked about there. Uh, so if we could put the Menti question up and I'll hand over to Ben. Thanks, Clive. Uh, yeah, and Anna, I don't know if you could stick the link in again just into chat in case people that have joined uh, haven't seen it or forgotten. Uh, <clears throat> so the next question is whether the 
agroforestry carbon code should be a standalone code or whether it should be linked to other codes like the uh, peatland, woodland, soil carbon codes, etc. Um, and obviously there's there's uh, bits of crossover, um, but equally bits where it's separate. A clear winner straight away that it should be linked to other codes. Uh, although yeah, significant few thinking it should be standalone. Uh, 100 or so votes so far. And quite a number still not sure, which is probably where we still are. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yes, so I'd say two thirds reckon it should be linked to another code and about a quarter not sure. Thanks Ben as you said I think that very much sits where we are with the project as well there's quite a lot going on um, around other code developments there's there's obviously some that have already uh, are already out there like wilder carbon and the peatland code and the woodland carbon code but lots of other emerging codes so we're effectively sort of developing this in a in an evolving space uh, which is why we're wondering about how this all fits together as well. So thank you for that. OK, I'm going to hand over to Will now. Over to you, Will. Good, thank you, Clive. Um, thanks very much and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Will Simonson from the, the Organic Research Centre. And over the next minutes, I'd just like to talk about the, the challenge of modelling the sequestration and storage of carbon in agroforestry, as well as the, the wider greenhouse gas um, emissions um, balance of these systems. And current thinking on, on how to approach this as part of the agroforestry carbon code project. Uh, next slide, please. Hannah. So as we all know, agroforestry is a, a multiple use land management approach in which trees are grown intermixed with cropping and or grazing. Some are traditional, such as wood pastures and, and boundary trees, uh, for example, shelter belts and hedgerows, uh, whilst more modern expressions um, of agroforestry focus on infield trees, especially tree rows, but also individual trees and groups of trees, um, especially in silver past pasture. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the potential ways of modelling carbon in these systems? Well, our, our starting point in the project has been the, the well-researched um, methodology and models behind the Woodland Carbon Code and its calculator. And indeed, this has been applied in agroforestry settings uh, through so-called effective area uh, approach, for example, in the farm carbon toolkit. However, trees growing in field uh, differ clearly from those growing in woodlands in their, their growth rates and their structural morphology, and the allocation of carbon to, to trunks and branches and foliage and roots. So it's always going to be an imperfect proxy means of estimation. And furthermore, quite a few of the tree species that are targeted in agroforestry, um, notably the fruit and nut trees, don't appear in the woodland carbon code uh, lookup tables. Next slide, please. So another um, approach uh, to this challenge uh, capitalises on the ever increasing availability of data on carbon storage in agroforestry sites across the world. And either extrapolating from these data points to sites with similar conditions or geography, uh, as in the carbon storage calculator that Winrock uses for forest landscape restoration projects, or more, more robustly and effectively applying a, a statistical approach, um, for example, a polynomial regression modeling uh, to the data to make predictions for new sites. So that's the sort of second approach to this challenge. Next slide, please. Another approach uses biophysical models of trees and crops and their growth and interactions. And so is, here is one example. It's the Excel based yield safe model developed at Cranfield University uh, under the EU Farm Safe project. Next slide, please. And uh, another example is this high safe model uh, developed at INRA in Montpellier, which draws on, the, on a, an even greater list of environmental 
and ecological parameters. Both models are realistic and powerful, but also data hungry for any one site and not, not all encompassing in terms of the uh, trees that can be, can be modeled. So there are some kind of challenges there. Next slide, please. So quite a different approach uses uh, terrestrial or airborne LIDAR or laser scanning, um, whose high resolution 3D point cloud data can provide a, a powerful tool for estimating uh, tree volumes and biomass and, and then carbon, sometimes as a means of calibrating uh, satellite passive remote sensing methods, so optical remote sensing or radar, um, to achieve um, even greater scales, if you like. So this high tech approach is used, for example, by the ACORN scheme of agroforestry creation run by Rabobank. But I think the important thing to point out here is that it represents a method mainly to validate rather than to, to predict perhaps the carbon that's being amassed at a, at a site. Next slide, please. Finally, and in a sense, returning back to the basics of, of tree measurement with the tape measures and clinometers, a uh, further approach uses models of tree growth, by which I mean development of tree girth and height with age, and also models of tree allometry, relating such measurements with above ground biomass as a means of estimating carbon in agroforestry trees. A number of such calculators already exists, especially in the application to urban trees, urban environments. Um, an example of that is the calculator um, that uh, has been developed by the Center for Urban Forest Research in the US. Uh, next slide, please. For the carbon in the tree components of an agroforestry system, we, we, we believe that this is the most accessible approach at the moment, working up from, from trees to, to tree uh, rows and groups and fields and then farms in a relatively accessible and transparent way, avoiding some of the kind of black box nature of some of these other modeling approaches. And yet, how do we fill the current gap in data models? Because there is a lack of evidence at the moment about the, the tree growth and the number of trees in trees growing in open field conditions in the UK. So how do we get around that? And could a farmer-led measurement approach help here, not just to parameterize a model for estimating carbon sequestration on any one target site, but over time also to help develop a, a database of tree growth across different climatic soil and site conditions um, around the UK? Next slide, please. So we've been thinking about how this uh, might work and, and let me just describe one scenario. So it begins with a farmer making a number of measurements of tree diameter at breast height, DBH, for individual trees of a range of different tree ages for the target species. So we are assuming here that there will be trees of that species of interest in the vicinity of the new agroforestry project. Um, the fact of there being so represents a good indicator of the tree being uh, well adapted to the local environment. Next slide, please. So the measurements of tree diameter A and age are then entered into a spreadsheet. And I should say there's another assumption here, which is that uh, indeed the, the at least the approximate age of the trees will be indeed known by the farmer as they collect this data. Next slide, please. So then this spreadsheet uses a nonlinear model fitting automation to obtain a, a DBH age relationship. And the, the equation shown here, and currently used in the Excel implementation, is that of McPherson and Simpson 1999, which was developed uh, from measurements of urban trees, but with characteristics that look appropriate for our purposes, including, for example, uh, having a sign-shaped uh, tree growth curve. Next slide, please. And in fact, the next one too, Anna. Thank you. So taking this fitted model, another regression equation is then needed to convert diameter growth to the uh, increase in above ground dry weight. A number of such equations based on destructive harvesting and weighing of trees show um, that tree girth is often um, more of a stable predictor of above ground dry weight than, than height. And this one of um, Bunce 1968 um, developed from broadleaved species, tree species in Cumbria is initially proposed. 
Although I should say that um, it's been, even though it's been widely applied, this particular one, uh, there's some criticism of its applicability, given the, the very specific site conditions in Cumbria from which the, the equation derives. Um, next slide, please. So further steps then include using um, standard uh, universal or perhaps tree specific assumptions on shoot to root ratios to derive the, the below ground weight component. Next slide, please. And and then conversion um, from weight to carbon, again, based on either a universal relationship or a tree specific one. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, doing the maths for numbers of trees of each species and um, for each co cohort then allows the derivation of fund estimates for the, the system in question. Next slide, please. So this just to uh, as an example, these results show um, estimates based on measurements of plum trees made at uh, Wakelands Agroforestry in, in Suffolk. And this is the results here being scaled up to a system of, of 2000 trees of that species. So it's showing on the left hand side the accumulation over time of carbon in the, the biomass of those trees. And then on the right hand side, the, the carbon sequestration rates of those trees. Peaking at a, an age between uh, 10 and 15 years. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we'll be asking for feedback on this approach through Menti in a few minutes. And of course, um, through your comments in chat, that, that'd be really welcome um, if you do to sort of um, put in your thoughts there. But returning to this schematic, there are obviously the other components of the system to, to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So this table compares significant contributions to the greenhouse gas balance of woodland and agroforestry systems. Um, the overlap is significant, but a number of tree management operations, um, for example, pruning and um, fruit harvesting would be unique to agroforestry. But we propose that in the immediate term, calculations embedded within the woodland carbon code calculator uh, could be used to model some of the agroforestry carbon balance components whilst other components require development of bespoke agroforestry methods. Just to give one example, um, so the production of seedlings, the tree seedlings in, in a nursery, uh, the estimation of this in the Woodland Carbon Code uh, uses a kind of near life cycle assessment approach um, to take into account the transportation, the on-site on energy use, the uh, construction of the nursery infrastructure. And it's based on a kind of pro rata per tree approach, which makes it ready, readily usable um, for an agroforestry calculation. Um, there's another example, the Woodland Carbon Code estimates of emissions due to ground preparation and um, disturbance, for example, through mounding and ploughing, could also potentially be applied to agroforestry using a sort of effective area based approach. What, what about the, the long term potential? carbon to be sequestered in and stored in soils, because obviously that's the other big area that I haven't yet spoken about. Uh, next slide, please. Because there are reasons to believe that these uh, the sequestration of carbon in soil could be significant with carbon input to the soil from litter fall, um, pruning residues, root turnover, root exudates, a contribution of the understory vegetation to, to name those, um, those processes. This um, is a um, this paper is a meta analysis led by a group at the Technical University of, of Munich, and it's recently be, re, recently been published. Uh, it compiles 61 observations from sites um, mostly across North America and Europe, and it shows as a general pattern that agroforestry sites, as expected, have higher stocks of soil organic carbon. Um, compared to control sites, and this applies to both the topsoil and the subsoil. But there is variability, um, as illustrated in the, the figures um, here on the right hand side of the slide. Control sites uh, were found in some cases to have more soil organic carbon, and this was perhaps due to um, some sort of history of land use or land use change. Um, whilst there are also differences um, between different types of agroforestry included in this meta-analysis, um, so hedgerows, which were included, have had more soil carbon than silver arable, which in turn had more um, soil 
organic carbon than silver pasture in general. Um, importantly, the, the authors recognise the need for, for more work to be done in temperate systems compared to tropical systems that are, are more studied. And for example, of the um, studies that were analysed, there were relatively few contained subsoil carbon measurements. And the factors that affect soil organic carbon sequestration potential are, are still poorly understood. So there's a lot to be done here. And in a first conservative approach, and until the science matures with some new work, which is getting underway in the UK, I've been hearing about those projects over the last, last weeks, we are therefore proposing that, that soil carbon can't be robustly included in a carbon calculator at this point, but this is something that we're you know, wanting to obviously carefully um, still consider and monitor over time. Next slide, please. So um, yeah, just coming back to this table um, finally for, for my final slide. And um, so just basically to say that ongoing work is looking at all these different components and developing some estimates based on um, published data for particularly the tree management components of agroforestry. Um, we also think about the, the right approach to emissions savings from the land taken out of crop or animal production and how that um, should be considered. Um, current thinking being not to include it so that the leakage effects neither have to be taken into account, but your, your thoughts on that would also be, be welcome. So, um, so yes, that comes to the end of my slides. Thanks, thanks for your, your interest and attention. And now we've got um, another mentee question to put or two to put to you. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Really fascinating and lots of really good um, discussion on the chat as you were talking as well. So I'm sure uh, when you get a chance to have a look back at that, uh, some great points. So uh, we've got, I think, two questions coming out now. So this is uh, slightly different. So rather than just um, clicking a button, you've got to sort of slide slide where you think it is. So how well developed is our scientific understanding uh, of carbon accumulation in agroforestry systems in the UK? So you might be basing that on what you just heard from Will or on your own knowledge. The left is very developed, uh, so that's a uh, high number, I think, uh, and on the right is not developed at all. Or is it the other way around? Anyway, very developed is left, not developed at all on the right. And at the moment, we seem to be somewhere in the middle. Although the kind of the peak is more towards the not developed at all. Uh, just over 100 respond. Just give it a little bit longer. Hovering around six. So a bit. A bit developed, but not not very developed broadly. I don't know if that uh, fits in well with your <clears throat> what you feel from your research. Yeah, I think it's pretty <laughs> pretty close. Yeah, great. So we'll uh, I think it's slowing down. So we'll go on to the next one. So the next question um, is around how realistic uh, is a farmer led tree measurement approach to developing estimates so you know as we heard from will it gets very expensive and um, complicated if you have to sort of do life's full cycle analysis of all of this stuff but um, if there was a relatively simple way of doing it uh, is that realistic do we think that farmers might actually do that um, particularly sort of with new agroforestry projects so on the left not realistic uh, and on the right very realistic I mean, certainly as a with my farming hat on, I can it felt kind of possible somehow. I don't know when I when I heard Will talking about it, it seems like, you know, you, it, it could work, particularly if there's a potential payment at the end as an incentive. But uh, more very evenly spread here. Lots of people don't feel it's realistic and yet quite a lot think it could be quite realistic. And even looks as though a few people say it's very realistic. We're hovering around the 4.8, somewhere in the middle. So, yeah, we've had 100 and 120 or so vote. It's a Pretty good much job dead in the middle. Pilots, then, isn't it, Ben? Absolutely. <laughs> How very neatly segued, Clive. <laughs> yeah, pretty much bang in the middle. 4.8. That's very useful to see that. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, everybody. 
Great, thanks. I'll hand over to Ilona to talk about the pilots. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, my name is Ilona. I'm Carbon Projects Manager at the Woodland Trust. I'm going to be talking about our on-site carbon, um, sorry, pilot approach for um, the Agroforestry Carbon Code, and then Sarah's going to follow me and talk about the financial appraisal side of things. So if we move on to the next slide. The objective of our pilot work stream um, is really to test the code on um, a different scale of businesses, that's farms and estates, small farms, etc., and different system approaches um, to do with agroforestry, really to test its effectiveness, its accessibility for farmers, um, and its investment potential for buyers of excess credits going to the market. I think we had a Mentimeter question on this, a kind of the ant anticipation that maybe potentially the agroforestry code when it's successful, the units could be used um, for farm offsetting and then any of those that are access to that could the market and, and how that would work. Um, so there's two people I really should mention that have helped identify some of the pilot stream uh, pilot schemes that we've got um, coming forward under the agroforestry scheme. Um, and that's Helen Cheshire, who's the Woodland Trust lead farming advocate um, and Ben Raskin as well who's handling our Mentimeter questions today he's the head of horticulture and agroforestry and um, both are agroforestry experts and both have um, networks to identify a real mix of um, sites to put under the scheme so that we can represent all different agroforestry systems and also different tree species as well. Um, just level of the pilot process here. And again, this is subject to change, I think, as we learn and move through um, doing the scheme. Um, but initially we've contacted landowners representing a real mix of schemes and different farm businesses as well. And um, we're going to follow that up before Christmas with a request for information to undertake um, pre-site visit baseline. Essentially, we're going to request as much documentation as possible, um, be that maps, uh, grant information if a grant was taken up, um, and any other information from the kind of income and cost side of, of the agroforestry scheme so that we can try and paint a picture. And then we're going to follow that up in the new year with a site visit uh, from two of the project team members within the group. Um, and that will be to fill any data gaps from the information we've already collected. Um, equally, we'll use that opportunity on site to interview the farmer um, and understand uh, their experience of agroforestry, what barriers of entry they might, barriers to entry they might have experienced, um, any grants if they've taken to, taken them up and how easy or difficult that is, the accessibility of some of the grants um, and any advice they can give us to factor in um, developing an agroforestry carbon code. Um, and then we'll follow that by finalising the whole picture of agroforestry systems. So that will be the lifetime finances, the carbon sequestration of some of the schemes um, and other factors as well, habitat buffering, improvement in animal and crop performance, if these things have been measured or not, um, some of it. Um, and then finally, that will be uh, blending the finance with Finance Earth. And Sarah is going to talk about this, doing the financial appraisal on some of our pilot sites um, and a carbon sequestration calculation as well. Um, we should know that the pilot sites we have, and I'm going to show that on the next slide. In fact, we can probably skip there now, um, are a real mix of existing agroforestry and new agroforestry. And we've also tried to mix the locations of some of the sites as well. Um, it, it's probably important to note for the additionality purposes of the Agroforestry Carbon Code that along the new agroforestry that should um, we put it under the code be successful in the long run in terms of being able to generate units. We're still very early stages, so we're not sure about um, that yet, but we have got schemes where new agroforestry is coming up. Um, so you can see from this slide, there's a real mix of um, organic, non-organic estate, um, smaller and larger farms, different locations. Um, the two pilots in Somerset and Devon are going to be grouped into one pilot and they've their agroforestry went in earlier this year. Um, equally, I should mention we've got we're, we're planning on having five pilot sites for England under the DEFRA funding and then we found out that we've got funding to do an additional two pilots in Scotland as well and potentially more in Wales, who knows, but it'd be really nice to get um, a um, within the scheme just so that we can test the code on on different um, systems in particular. Um, so that would be me and I Sarah who's going to talk about the financial appraisal. Thanks Alona. Um, hopefully you can all see me okay. I was dropping off a little bit then. Um, 
but I'm Sarah Dara. I'm an associate at Finance Earth. Um, for anyone who hasn't come across us before, we're a social enterprise um, and we specialise in financial advice and investment um, funds, uh, specifically to try and scale up um, the private sector investment um, into into the UK and internationally. Um, so to kind of set the scene a little bit with that, we know that the amount of public investment and philanthropic grants um, is not enough to deliver on the 25 year environment plan um, goals. So we really need to be looking at how we can crowd in private funding and in private repayable investment um, to meet this 60, um, 6 1 billion um, pounds per year um, gap that we've got um, for nature. Um, so if you just skip to the next animation. Thanks. So we're looking really at this um, Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund project in that context. So how can agroforestry carbon projects be designed in a way that um, unlock private finance to be able to play a role in filling that gap. Um, so if we start with an agroforestry project um, and then next animation, we've then got the investors and this is where we really want to see upfront financing of the project costs um, based on repayments from those investors from the revenues. So if you go to the next animation, that's really where the, the verified carbon credits fit in. Um, so this is sort of moving away from the model that we've seen a little bit in carbon markets where um, sometimes the carbon project is funded through um, what's called pending issuance units um, and then they're verified later after that's been delivered. Um, and we see as the markets are sort of developing um, a trajectory towards high integrity markets would be selling verified carbon credits after they've been delivered and having then the role um, for investors to fund the upfront costs um, and the maintenance costs um, as well as any financing costs um, down the line and that also de-risks um, the investment for the project deliverer. Um, I think we've seen a lot um, recently about the, the unknowns around inflation um, and if you're entering a project into a scheme you need to be funding the long-term maintenance and these are often quite long-term projects. Um, so if you just do the next two animations Anna, thank you. So we've got investors um, sort of at the start of the project coming in and they'll be looking for whether there's confidence in those underlying revenue streams to actually repay their investment. So the lower the confidence, the higher the risk and the higher the returns the investors will be looking for. Um, so we'll be delving quite a lot into how confident are we um, that there will be buyers for agroforestry carbon credits. Um, and we see this role for finance as really bridging the timing gap between a project getting set up and then revenue being generated down the line. Um, and then next animation, Anna. Yeah, so just basic principles. We'll be looking at the investment case for some of these pilot sites. And the main question we'll be looking at is whether the revenue that could be generated through the sale of verified carbon credits um, meets the total upfront costs, the ongoing maintenance costs for the site and any of those financing um, risk adjusted returns to investors. And moving to the next slide. So these are the sort of three finance questions that we'll be looking at and the financing work stream is sort of mainly in the pilots, but also um, we'll be looking at the financing questions across the whole of the of the project to make sure that the standard is designed in a way that actually unlocks private investment. Um, so we'll be looking at what role private finance can play in UK agroforestry carbon projects. Um, and that is obviously underpinned by the availability of the underlying science um, and how confident we are in that. We'll be then looking at what the market demand is for agroforestry carbon credit. So that's quite an important question that we'll be testing with stakeholders and, and buyers. So there's a well established market for woodland carbon credits um, and emerging market for peatland carbon. So we need to know whether buyers are, are interested in um, agroforestry carbon credits. Um, and part of that is also just sharing the benefits um, um, that are created with investors and sort of telling the story of all of the, the additional benefits that can be realised. Um, 
and then linked to the investment case um, we'll be testing what a reasonable price is for agroforestry carbon credits um, based on the sequestration rate and the delivery costs. So we'll need to understand uh, what price we need to sell at to break even on those costs, but also what the kind of upper end of the range could be um, to make it a suitable investment model. And then final slide is just our work stream. So we don't really have anything to share yet on the, the findings of the um, financial analysis and the, the case for investment because we're right at the beginning. Um, but we'll be progressing through, so engaging with the pilot sites and we'll look at three um, full financial models um, for three different types of pilot sites. Um, we'll build up those models and look at the revenue that can be generated and the, the cost projections long term. Um, try and identify what the financing need is, where it is and in the cash flow profiles, um, engage with buyers, to test appetite and pricing. Um, then there'll be a sort of circular um, model for that of testing and refining based on buyer and stakeholder engagement um, to make sure we've got the assumptions right and the models are robust. And then ultimately we'll be sharing all of that with the, the NEIRF community, but wider stakeholders as well to make sure that those learnings are all, all shared. And that's it for me. And I think we move to another Mentimeter question now. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got one more Mentimeter question. Uh, and it's a bit of a kind of future gazing one, I guess, uh, in a way. And obviously what Sarah's just outlined, we'll be looking at a lot of this during the project. but. When compared with other nature based carbon credits, how attractive do you think agroforestry based carbon credits will be for investors? And obviously there's sort of a lot of unknowns. The agroforestry systems tend to be a bit more expensive per tree to set up, but then potentially the trees grow faster. So there's sort of lots of unknowns really. So what have we got? So a good, I don't know, third, a third think they're equally attractive. A uh, quarter think they're less attractive. A small number of people think they're more attractive. And a quarter really don't know. So we've got about 100 answered so far. Let's give it a little bit longer. Yeah, proportions I think aren't changing. So that's a tricky one, isn't it? I would say uh, pretty split on that. I guess, again, not surprising before a lot of that market research has been done, but that's interesting to see sort of where people feel it is at the moment. Equally attractive, sort of gaining strength a little bit, maybe. Right, back to you, Clive. Thanks, Ben. Um, OK, well, that has gone very quickly, hasn't it? That's an hour um, that we've spent giving you a very quick introduction to what we're calling the agroforestry carbon code project um as you as we said at the start we're very much at the start of the project um and it's been fascinating while i haven't been speaking to be looking in the chat uh, and seeing all the different observations and questions uh, and also the responses to the menti questions that we've posed to you because uh, I think many of the many of you are in a very similar place to, to us in terms of asking some of those questions, particularly um, I think this kind of point about the scope of this compared to other codes that are being developed. Uh, so I put in the chat that the kind of missing bit at the moment based on other codes that are either e exist or um, might exist in the future is the in-field agroforestry systems, but as we all know, they're only one part of agroforestry. Um, hedges uh, and woodlands and shelter belts and, and, and riparian strips are just as valid and important agroforestry systems uh, as in-field trees are. So one of the questions, and I think I've seen it there in the chat, will be from a landowner's, a farmer's perspective as to how this can be as seamless and joined up as possible. Um, because from an administrative point of view, these might have all been developed separately uh, and exist in separate places, but on a farm, um, it's not like that. So we need to um, work with some of the other codes uh, and help answer some of those other questions. Uh, and then another theme I think in the chat was around the sort of balance between practicality and robustness uh, and rigour. 
Uh, and Sarah sort of introduced another dimension to that as well in her presentation, which is about um, the market very much moving now to um, actual carbon credits rather than the idea of carbon credits in the future, so pending issuance credits. Um, so again, that's another th another thing that we're going to have to wrestle with in terms of the overall investment case here. Um, but yeah, fascinating. And uh, I hope it was worthwhile as doing this as a very early intervention from the project's point of view. Um, as you can tell, we don't have very many of the answers to the questions that you're posing, but we now do have some very rich um, comments in the chat and also the response to the mentee questions. And as I said at the start, um, we're committed to, to finding other ways to engage uh, and getting um, more feedback and, and more response to, to wherever we get to uh, over the next six to eight months.